Hey everybody, thanks for downloading this episode of the Agile Wire. We're really thrilled about the feedback we've been getting from people and the comments about how valuable they found the conversations. Please keep both criticism and feedback coming. It's how we continue to get better. And be sure to subscribe and pass along the podcast to others that might find it valuable. We touched on a topic with Bradley Clerken in the past about his experience with Holacracy, and we had a chance to sit down and really do a deep dive with an expert in the area. Jonathan Yankovich is a management consultant who helps startups, and one of the tools in his toolbox is Holacracy. It was a fun conversation, and we ended up jumping all over, from Holacracy's evolutionary approach to organizational structure to hiring practices. We hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Agile Wire, where professional scrum trainers Jeff Boobles and Jeff Molesky discuss agile topics. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Boobles and Jeff Molesky. All right. So I was at, at lunch today with uh, someone, and they asked me what I was doing this weekend. I said, oh, tonight I'm recording a podcast with uh, Jonathan um, Yegovich, and he's, they say that right? Yep, that's right. Yep. And, uh, and we're going to talk about Holacracy. And they're like, whoa, what's Holacracy? And so I gave them my best uh, explanation on the side, and I wanted to see what you, what you think of this. So I said, right, well, cool. so I said it's a decentralized... Um, structure, um, you know, so like normal org structures are very hierarchical, very pyramid shaped. This is like circles of different uh, decentralized structures and then it allows teams to self-organize and manage themselves without this central control, but still stay aligned around a common vision. Is that a pretty that, decent explanation? That sounds pretty accurate, yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's something I deal with is like, how do I describe this? <laughs> I've got 20 seconds in an elevator or I meet someone and they're like, what do you, you know, what do you do? What are you up to? And if I really don't want to talk to the person, I say uh, business management consulting. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if they're into it, then we get into like, yeah, purpose alignment and vision and new ways to work together and aligning your personal vision with the organizational vision. Um, and bringing your whole self to work and having the freedom to express yourself um, and feeling safe and just like there's layers and layers of 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 stuff in it. Um, but actually, I was just at uh, at CultureCon the past couple days yeah. here in mm. Madison. Here in Madison, and I thought like, okay, cool, these are my peeps. Like everyone, like they're gonna know what's <laughs> up. And most of the people I talked to didn't know what Holacracy was. They'd never heard it before. They mostly knew what Agile was, you know, Agile stuff. Um, I don't know if, if someone could tell me the difference between like Scrum and Kanban necessarily, but um, but I still found even even the people that are kind of on the bleeding edge of uh, organizational culture design um, don't necessarily know about holacracy itself. So um, anything I can do to educate people or help just help answer questions, I'm totally into it. Awesome. What, why do you think that is? Um, I think. Or, uh, sorry, let me be more specific. Why do you think they're not aware of holacracy? Um, holacracy itself is pretty radical, and I think most organizations are still dealing with ideas like being values aligned, and um, you know, even even the notion of mindfulness, like being more mindful at work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I talked to one, actually went on a date with a woman when I lived in San Francisco, and she was an executive coach, and she's, she said, oh, yeah, I, I teach mindfulness to executives. And then she kind of looked at me and said, basically, I, I, I teach them how to have eye contact. <laughs> and, and so I think the bar for what counts as, like, transformation is pretty low in most organizations, generally. Um, so I think that's part of why holacracy is not not that well known. Hmm. Would you say, I know um, you've done some work in Silicon Valley and you've spent some time in the Netherlands and those are kind of two more progressive areas I would think in the world when it comes to organizational um, structure and just, you know, the way they structure, you know, things in the, in, in holistically. Um, would you say that there it's a much more popular than it is other places? Yeah, I mean, I think I've always, I've always personally had kind of a non-standard growth path in my life. Um, you know, I never went to a four-year school. I've never worked in corporate. Um, and in the Bay Area, yeah, like startups, it's all about let's get this done by whatever means we need to. And 
a lot of that is discovering systems and patterns that work. And I think that's where a lot of Agile probably came out of, like, this, what we're doing isn't working. Let's try something else. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for me, it's just natural to, you know, work to, to work with ambiguity and to work with um, frequent change and, you know, have change be a fairly constant thing. Um, and then as far as the Netherlands, actually, my work with Holacracy took me to the Netherlands, but that's where the, there is a lot of... Um, there is a lot of uh, effort there around uh, kind of future of work and new ways of working together. Um, and it's also a very cerebral place, it seems. Like the, the, the Dutch are fairly cerebral people, fairly fairly um, more more head than heart, if I can make that generalization. I'm mm. sorry if that offends any Dutch people. Um, and they're also some of my favorite people. Um, but what about that? Um, Holacracy has a lot of rules, and I think it appeals to people who are into structure. Um, but it also holds the polarity of, of giving people freedom. So it's um, th there's a lot to it, and you can see different things in it. I, th I think some people come to Holacracy thinking, "Oh, this will be great. We can do whatever we want. It's flat. We have everyone can do you know be empowered to just like go nuts and 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 be fun and creative all the time." And then they realize there's, you know, a 25 page document called the Holacracy Constitution that everyone has to agree to follow in order to work together. I, I can't remember if it was if it was from your talk or or the book, because I listened to the book a few times now. But there was a phrase that's coming to mind as, as you were just mentioning that um, I think it's freedom through tyranny or, or something close to that. Um, probably freedom from tyranny. Uh, uh, rules without um, yeah. something about rules without rulers. Or yeah, like... it it was more it was more just saying that um, once everybody had a clear understanding of what they were accountable for, it it just freed them to actually do the work instead of trying to figure oh. out who was responsible for doing what. Right. Exactly. Um, so one part of it is one of the great things and kind of one of the easier cells is that um, when you when you have holacracy in place, everyone has very clear roles and accountabilities that describe how they work together. So I know what I can count on you for. And um, to that end, um, that really facilitates people working together. But then it also tells you what you can't count on someone for. And I think I think probably what you're thinking of is the idea that you, you don't really know your freedom until you know the limits of your freedom. Um, good analogy is like living in living in America, one of the one of a very free place, right? Well, we have we have rule of law, and the mm -hmm. rule the rule of law says you, you can't take my property, you can't um, you know restrict my freedom, put me in jail, kill me, and now that I know that, I have the freedom to be myself with you you know, go back to a kingdom of a thousand years ago, and as a peasant, I don't know what's going to happen to me if I voice my opinion. Now, let's go to modern day corporate America. <laughs> How is it really any different? Do I, like, can I voice my opinion? Am I free or am I at risk of, you know, getting my head chopped off uh, because the, the ruler, the boss, the CEO at whatever level doesn't like what I say or doesn't like how I dress or whatever? Am I really any more free than a peasant a thousand years ago? Yeah. So there, and I don't want to just spend the time talking about select quotes from the, from the book, but there was there was one that I really liked, and just the analogy that that he uses. So uh, the human body functions uh, efficiently and effectively not with a top-down command system, but with a distributed system. A network of autonomous self-organizing entities are distributed throughout the body. Each has a function and the autonomy about how to complete that function. What I really liked was he, he was talking about essentially like if your white blood cells encounter uh, something attacking the body, it doesn't go to the brain uh, and through 17 levels of bureaucracy <laughs> to get the okay to go and do the job of defending the body. It, it understands this is its role, this is its purpose, and it, it has the freedom to just go and do that. Um, and, and I really like that analogy. It really sat well with me. Yeah, and that, that, that is a great analogy for how holacracy-powered organizations work. Um, what they use in the trainings, and the, that, that, that quote was from Brian Robertson in the book Holacracy, for anyone that's listening, great book. Um, in a short read, it's like six hours on audio. Um, yep. Let's see. Uh, 
so it's another, well, another analogy that they use is um, the idea of a city. Like there's no top down organizing body in a city. You know, there are businesses, there are customers, and they all have rules around how they interact. And it gives rise to this emergent, this incredibly complex emergent behavior. Um, so in that, I think that that's another example, the human body, a city, and these are examples of what we call holarchies. There's something that is both whole, like, like the whole, the, every part is whole in and of itself. Um, a family is whole and complete in and of itself and part of a larger organism, a neighborhood, a district, a city, a, the whole world. Cool. Yeah, I, w I want to tie on to Jeff's analogy. I was just um, reading this book, uh, The Starfish and the Spider. I don't know if you guys ever read that book. No. It's, it's talking about the difference between centralized and decentralized organizations. And um, they were talking about how a spider, like, you cut off its head and it dies, right? But you cut basically any part off of a starfish and it just regenerates and it, it stays alive. So holacracy is kind of like a starfish in that it's this decentralized organization where if you cut a piece off, it, the rest of it still still survives. You just got to figure out who those two roles that they need to have other teams do or do they need to build hire more or whatever the thing is, right? Like, it's, it's very... Um, resilient to to change and to um attacks i guess uh, on it totally yeah it's kind of like the internet that way right the internet exactly or other examples would be like um like wikipedia right like you could have vandals on there but you don't because so many people clean it up or craigslist you know like yeah. people everybody contributes to it and it kind of becomes this community or another one's Elkana uh AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, they're, they're very decentralized in that anyone can spin up a AA meeting in any town, any place, and there's no, like, central government or central, you know, headquarters that, like, has to approve this or anything like that. So there's there's a number of those out there um, that right, work that right. way. AA is a cool example because they, they have a set of rules for how they work internally and probably how they work externally. And just by following those rules, you can be successful. Um, there's one example that I, I'm hesitant to share, but I just it's top of mind. And I've never heard anyone say this about holacracy, so if I'm like offending a colleague, sorry. Um, but it's kind of like terrorist cells. It's like it is. We're we're all organized around these principles. Yep. And and every cell can operate. Every circle can operate independently and autonomously. And we get resources from the broader circle, right? Like there's there's organization and orchestration at all levels. Um, and there's there's freedom to try things and and to have change. Yeah, there was there was something Jeff hit on earlier that I think we we haven't mentioned explicitly yet, but there was he uh, again. I, I'm sorry, is it Brian the the author of the book? Brian, Brian yeah. Okay, um, mentioned numerous times that it's it's this evolutionary approach to to organizational structure. Like it is it is meant to keep keep changing and you mentioned this i think with these there, there was another good quote that you brought up but systems with no tensions are dead it, i love that it's, yeah it's that the the intent of this is that there will consistently be tensions because the system the structure is responding to uh, a tension or a need a desired change in the present state and like that that really just sings to the whole agility, like us, uh, adaptiveness, responsiveness. We're not just with product development, but with our organizations. Those two need to continuously adapt to the marketplace, need to continually adapt to change. And I think that's just kind of a, a, a really cool sweet spot for Holacracy to be able to articulate that, that it is the organization responding to change. Um, you just happen to call it Holacracy and you deal with it like this versus scrum and we deal with it like that right and I, I love the analogies between like scrum and holacracy and holacracy takes a lot of influence from from agile even the the whole notion of roles that really originated i think with with the notion of you know we have a product owner that has a certain role and we have developers and and whatnot um and it doesn't even have to be as abstract as like oh the system has the ability to process tensions it's just think about your own life you you have tensions we all have tensions and they're things we want to change and improve in our lives and we we feel those tensions right attention is something you feel it's a it's a felt sense it's not it's not an abstraction it, it's a it's a real it's a real thing 
and you know when you have a tension. You know, I want to, I, I, I still want to lose a few, a uh, few percent body fat, right? So, okay, so now I've got a tension. How am I going to process that? Well, I've got certain pathways. I can eat less. I could go to the gym. I could get surgery. I don't know. Um, you know, but what holacracy does is it says, okay, organizations have tensions. Work groups have tensions. Individuals have tensions. And really, it everything comes down to individuals. But, um, okay, so how do we process those? And then we have what's called many pathways. There are many pathways to process attention in holacracy. That's part of what makes it so hard to explain. Like in Agile, it's like, okay, so there's a backlog and it's stack ranked and we take the top thing off and then we fix that or do that and then we roll those up, we roll some of those up and then we just deploy them and then maybe there's some new ones. Mm -hmm. And it's a very linear, it's, 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 it's a, it's a cyclical process, but you know what you're doing in each of the events that are out there. Like, there's a certain thing we're inspecting and adapting, and a certain way we're giving transparency to something, right? So, yeah. And there's a pipeline, yep. right? There's a, there's, a fair, there's a fairly clear pipeline. In Holacracy, it's like, okay, you've got attention. Well, do you, do you want to take action in one of your roles, or do you want to set a new expectation and change the role structure? Do we need a whole new circle, a new division? Like there's a lot, there's many, um, many pathways. And so when someone's like, well, how do I, how do I make sure I have the right people on my team? Well, there's, you know, many pathways. And so it's, it's hard for me to, when, when I'm talking to people, I, it's hard for me to like articulate, like just, just do this one little thing. Um, but that's also what I love about it. Cause it makes this, this, this rich, like practice that you, that you learn, learn about and deepen into and discover new things about. And I'm by no means an expert. I mean, I'm probably, I'm probably one of the more knowledgeable people about in the world. I've spent about it. I've spent you know four years working with Holacracy One um, alongside the, the guy the guy that made it and, and so on. And God, I just feel like an amateur half the time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's so cool. Well, there's something that be said about like most experts find that the more they learn something in their field, the more they learn they don't know everything, and then they need to dig deeper and learn more. Right. So right. I think that's a pretty normal feeling. Cool. Cool. So I, I actually want to go back just a little bit uh, to something you were talking about earlier, because um, just general governance. So you were talking about rule of law and um, I, I like I am by no means an expert, so I'm totally going to be stepping outside of my my expertise here. But um, something that I become really fascinated with is just government in general and by extension governance. And so uh, in some of the classes, I, I like bringing to uh, the attention of people is, you know, with with agility in Scrum in particular, there's there's a lot of focus around the people and, and rightfully so. Um, and there's this kind of, um, you know, individuals and interactions over process and tools, but you, you know, we have to understand that people are complex and you're gonna have to work with other people. And you may wanna set up something like a working agreement, uh, which I, when I'm teaching students, I. I associate that with that's that's essentially your constitution that's you setting out how you are going to handle situations how you're going to hold each other accountable um, how you are going to have a rule of law and that's what a republic has that is what if you're a u.s citizen you live in a republic uh, and so uh, people often conflate the two with a with a democracy um, and they think oh well we vote and we're in a democracy well well kind of but you vote and you win because that's how it is outlined in the the, the constitution, in, in the rules that govern the system. So I, I just think it's it's very neat the way that Holacracy does give you these set of rules that every, like, is there a question? Who owns this? Who's responsible? Who's accountable for, for these things? Well, let's go check the rule book, so to yep. speak, or the constitution or wherever that stuff lives. And to what you were talking about earlier, it just, it allows freedom at that point to understand, hey, since like we all understand the, ro the rules of soccer, um, now we can all go and enjoy the playing the game of soccer because we've established the rules at this point and now we can have a, a, a fun time. And then um, uh, along that analogy, we also have a referee, just like in, in Holacracy, we, we have totally. like that facilitator whose sole purpose, or I shouldn't say sole purpose, and correct me here, um, is to not manage the system, but hold people accountable to the system, hold people accountable to the rules. Is that accurate? Right. It's totally accurate. And 
just like you wouldn't go like we wouldn't we wouldn't say okay let's go play some pickup soccer we wouldn't like go get the 300 page fifa manual and like study it you don't do holacracy by reading the constitution and internalizing every single rule you just get out there and you start doing it and the, mm -hmm. facil the facilitator is there to make sure you don't go too far outside the lines and we all make mistakes you're you're going to make mistakes and that's fine right it's it's not wrong and people are i think especially in maybe corporate culture people are used to living in this world where they're they're defending themselves from being wrong and making sure they're perceived properly and and um you know like the the value is on not screwing up in holacracy it's a learning process and a practice and you just jump in and you start doing stuff and you ask questions um I mean, even if you go through the the, five, the four four and a half day training, the holacracy practitioner training, you come out like sort of able to practice, kind of. You don't come out like an expert. Um, and even in organizations that are doing it, they're you know the the facilitators are learning, the coaches are learning. Uh, so, what am I trying to say there? Like, yeah, there's totally a rule of law, and it gives rise to freedom. And instead of um, you were talking about the rules of democracy instead of like hey everybody vote and let's all see basically like when someone says is it democracy i kind of say like I, I equate that with mob rule like no it's not mob rule yeah um there's actually a process it's actually even it's actually even better than so what am i saying here um when i say it's not mob rule it's also not um author authoritarian it actually gives a lot of attention to an individual's tensions. So the smallest, the, the the smallest person on the end of the line who's out there with the customer, who has the least power in the organization, they have the same levers and knobs available to change the organization as anyone else. And if they sense attention, even if no one else in the organization senses it, they can bring that to governance, and the facilitator will defend their position just as much as they'll defend the circle lead or the GCC lead link or anyone else in the organization. So in that way, um, there's a ton of rules and it's, and it's not about consensus. Consensus is kind of a dirty word even, like it's, just, it's like the C word. Like consensus yep, yep. is actually a, a, a bad thing um, and it's a thing that slows us down. Like let's, let's spend the next six months trying to get buy-in and consensus on this idea that's what happens in corporate from what I understand. And um, I've heard stories of companies that have adopted holacracy and they start going through the meeting process and th you know, three of the people say like, oh, that meeting was so structured and it was such a pain in the ass. And one guy is like, I've been trying, I've had this conversation 10 times and this is the first time we've ever actually made a decision about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I'll tell people like, I don't care about consensus, I want commitment. Like we need to make a decision and move on something. We don't need to spend the next six hours all trying to come to an alignment on what we all feel like is the best thing and blah, blah, blah. No, just commit and go. Right. And um, and we also have what's called dynamic steering to use the, the fancy word from the book. But, uh, but basically any decision that you make, you can unmake it. The rules mm. can be changed, right? So it's a lot of it is about, uh, yes, like full commitment to what is decided and then the ability to also change that when it doesn't suit uh i'm trying not to say us because you know who is us exactly but but the organization um, right the organization right yeah yeah i think the thing that's really cool about hol holacracy is that it has a process and it's really well defined how you handle conflict accountability how you deal with those those things that are really hard for a lot of people to deal with and then it, it dynamically changes as you need to change. So you never really go through a reorg. You just are always kind of reorging as you need to. And so just yep. like this morphing amoeba of a, of a organization that just is always adapting to its current situation and, and doing the best thing for the organization at that time with the information that it has. So I think that's a pretty cool thing and a pretty agile way to be structured um, as it's, an organization. In that, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, um it's kind of like the governance meetings are sort of like retrospectives, right? What, what, right. what tensions are we feeling and how are we going to process them? How are we going to agree to work together differently? It's just that we also have constructs and specific language for exactly how we do that. 
right? So now we have an abstraction called an accountability and a domain and a policy. And these all have specific meanings that when we have the common language around roles, domains, accountabilities, we can now have discussions about um, discussions about the structure of the organization itself. Um, kind of like in software development, you know, we have the idea of like a model and like a, of a screen and a, you know, a user flow or whatever. Um, you need to have the language, the language primitives to even have a conversation about it. Right. But until until you have language, you really have nothing. I mean, there's you can't there's you know there's nothing there until there's a common understanding. So I know you you had mentioned earlier that you were at Holacracy One for a while, and I know when we briefly talked last time, you you gave a, a little bit of background, starting out as a developer, kind of moving around. Um, can you revisit that story a little bit? Yeah, sure. So. Um, uh, I was working in uh, in the Bay Area at various startups, doing you know three month contract, six month contract kind of thing, taking companies from basically like an idea and sometimes starting a brand new project and you know building out M uh, MVPs, minimum viable products for you know for various people that had idea ideas. And um, a friend of mine, I was I, I'm really into the kind of psychology and uh, and human development and uh, I was on I was on Facebook one day and a friend of mine who went through this course that I also went through. Uh, I saw one of those little boxes pop up that said, you know, so-and-so has, has a new job at Holacracy One. And I was like, whoa, wow, Michael's got a job at Holacracy One? Um, and I messaged him and just said, hey, oh, man, like you knew what up? Holacracy One was? Like, oh, yeah. is it a big thing out there? So, okay. so no, so this was also around the time of Zappos's transformation. Zappos is one of the, mm. big, the biggest customers that's doing Holacracy. And so there's lots of articles about, you know, Zappos has gone flat and they're doing Holacracy. And, that's not exactly right, but um, sure. But I, I had heard of Holacracy. I, have, I had thought I had been fascinated with it before I even got close to the organization. Um, and in my mind, it was this this thing that was, you know, I was just I was just some dude. I would you know I would never get close to an organization like that. Uh, well, it turns out organizations are made of people, <laughs> and uh, people are you know people. Um, and so Michael introduced me to. Um, to Holacracy One, and I interviewed, and I flew out, and I went to one of the retreats, and I met all the folks, um, and uh, basically started working there, and worked there for four years. It was a, it's a, it's a distributed organization, so we all work at home, or cafes, or or co-working, or whatnot. Um, hmm. But that was kind of how I got involved with it. What was that interview process like? Um, so there's that's a great question. So there's a there's two kind of things that that they they were looking for, um, and one is called organization fit, org fit. Like, is this guy a good fit for the kind of the values of the company, the the biases of, of the company, the things the company is looking for? Um, and then there's also role fit. Does he have the skills to execute in the roles that we think he'd be good for? So like, can he write code, right? Can he, is he a sure. software developer? And that was more of a technical interview, role fit kind of thing. And then there's the org fit, and that's where you're meeting with all the partners. Um, and there's a there's a, actually there was a role called a tenured partner that was filled by about five or six people, and that involved you know Brian Robertson, um, Alexia Bowers, um, uh, Olivier. There's a, f a few other people. Lewis. I I don't want to leave anyone out, but I can't remember everyone right now. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, this role called tenured partner, and you can actually look this up if you go on uh, Glassfrog, which is the Holacracy management tool that Holacracy One makes. Um, the governance is all public. You can, you can go find the tenured partner. In fact, what would you Google for? Tenured partner Holacracy One role. That would probably bring it up. Um, you can go look at that role and see the accountabilities. This role is uh, responsible for or accountable for. Um, for interviewing people and assessing role fit, so basically, basically, um, I flew out to this big house in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, um, in the country with uh, with the Amish or the the Mennonite. Mennonites or whatever they have out there, the Mennonites, yeah. Um, and there was actually one time when I was I was driving to the to the grocery store and I had to pass a, a horse drawn buggy uh, huh. on the road. So, um, so there's a big house out there. That's where Brian's residence is. And about every three months, uh, the whole organization flies out to flies out and spends about a week to ten days 
uh, working together and playing together and working on more strategic issues face to face. Um, these retreats were like the best part of the job for me. I loved it. Um, and I got involved in like we we cook big meals and you know hang out and play board games and stay up late and like stay up late writing code and just like great time. It was like it was like a part. It was like a it was my ideal environment. It was like a work party all the time, kind of. Mm. Um, but anyway, so I went out there, never met any of these people, dropped into this like work party vibe for a couple a couple few days and met with a few few different people and I met with Brian. Um, just went downstairs into one of the little bedrooms and sat across from him and had a chat. And um, he did this interesting thing. He said, let's play a game. I want you to convince me not to hire you. And I will, what was the opposite of it? Basically, it was the polarity of like, let's have an interview where we like want to make this work. Like, tell me why I shouldn't hire you and I'll tell you why you shouldn't work here. Hmm. And that was really like, oh, wow. Mm. And so that was, a, that was really a great way to, um, to be vulnerable and real. And um, it was just a great example of how in so much of the culture around Holacracy One anyway, probably Holacracy powered organizations in general, and there's a subtle distinction there, but maybe it's, maybe it's not necessary to talk about here. Um, there's a lot of attention on shifting the polarities that are traditional, right? So instead of like, oh, like, oh yeah, we have common, like, let's talk about our common values in the school we went to and what, what chums we'll be and, you know, like convince each other that we like each other. It's, it's the opposite. It's like, well, you know, talking about our weaknesses and, and through that, you actually get to something more real. So, I, th this is super intriguing, uh, and part of what spur, uh, Menlo Innovations has a, a fairly unique um, way that they bring people in. Have you heard of Menlo Innovations or the? Okay, so uh, the author Richard Sheridan wrote Joy Inc. Um, and inside of there, they talk about their hiring process, where they bring in essentially waves of people. So if they're hiring for a developer role, they'll bring in six, eight, ten, whatever that number is, um, and They'll have two people coming in and interviewing and they'll give them basically they're testing for kindergarten skills like they want to see how do they behave with one another like is somebody a jackass and you wouldn't even want to work with them but how essentially the first round um let me see if i can remember correctly but it's to make your partner look good right like that's how you get to the next round is by making the other person look good and then in the next round um i think it's uh something similar but now they're starting to give you actual things that you would be doing on the job and, and you're still working with each other and then i think by the time you get to the third round it's um you're working with somebody work. from menlo and you're and it's like yeah. three weeks and you're partnering and then it's yeah are you in or out kind of at, the, at that point but i mean these are kind of paid time but it's kind of like the short-term thing to say like it's a temporary thing until we realize yeah this is a good culture fit uh, but I, I you know the pairing thing is really cool because i i think they talked about how um jeff and i actually went there and we toured menlo oh wow and, and um they were talking about how yeah we tell these candidates you know uh you need to just make your partner look good that's our that's our you know that's our success factor right now. And they, they think they have to solve the problem and it's, and they don't really care if you solve the problem. They care that you make your partner look good and that you have good kindergarten skills, like Jeff said. And it's just funny how many people just like totally, you know, fail that, that part of it. And, and, you know, just treat it like a regular interview where I got to look good and I have to have all the answers. Right. And, um, and so it's really cool that you brought up this story about how like, well, let's just talk about our weaknesses. Cause you know, that's a, that's a hard thing to talk about. And, why shouldn't you work here? And here's all of our dirty laundry. And uh, now do you still want to work here? Do we still want you? Well, okay. Well, let's yeah. just go. Now that everything's on the table. I, let, I really yeah, like that. I, yeah, I, I think a typical interview is just like, who can bullshit better to the other person, <laughs> right? right? Um, and that's that's why I wanted to hear like what a little bit more around your interview process. Um, like, aside from the culture did, and, and sitting down with, with Brian at that one meeting, were there numerous meetings with other people? Was it like, what, can you expand on anything yeah, more? Yeah, so there, there were, so there were, there were a few on the technical side. Um, there was never a whiteboard or a little room that got too hot where you had to sit for too long. Um, 
It was all pairing. It was all pair programming. Like, let's sit down. Let's open up the bug tracker. Let's pick something. Let's pick something kind of easy, you know, and let's talk through some problems and see how you think and see what it's like to work with you and talk to you. Um, and I think that's a great way. That I think that's a great way to interview. Like, I... I can't stand technical interviewing, <laughs> either either as the interviewee or the interviewer, right? I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, well, how much do you know about this specific little framework detail that I'm talking about because I know about it, and now I want to see if you know about it. Like, I hate that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so there's, you know, pair, pair programming, um, and then what was really interesting was the the... the you're in you're in the woods in a house with 20 strangers and you, you've got a room to sleep in and everything so like how do you spend your discretionary time you know it's up to you you could go just be a recluse that's fine um it's not going to necessarily get you the job or not um but there's also something about like um just just kind of hanging out just kind of getting to know people um though i, I gotta say they, they that really wasn't like a major criteria for like if you get hired or not it's not like oh is he cool and chummy and like you know like it's fun to hang out with like that's not a that's not a it's not an org fit and it's not a role fit um concern so people are really clear about like like you could be totally on the spectrum like really you know quiet and difficult to talk to but you could still you know value transformation and be a good org fit and be a brilliant developer and will totally hire you um, mm. because you don't have to share this is the thing about va about values versus like structure like you or, or values versus purpose i should say values versus purpose you don't have to like share all the same values as me to work with me as long as we, we have governance and we're working towards the same purpose so as long as we're doing those two things you can be you can be an alien from mars mm. and it's cool because we're both working towards the same purpose and we have rules and norms and this goes back to working agreements um we have rules and norms around how to relate to each other yeah i think hopefully this will be the last quote that i drop in here but uh the entire point of holacracy is to better allow an organization to express its purpose and then the other quote was governance of the organization through the people for the purpose so i I, I thought those were two really great quotes, again, from the book, but just kind of hitting home the point that it to what you were just talking about is it's about the purpose. It's about helping the organization live the purpose. Right. Which is a great way to look at yourself, too. Right. Like, what am I up to on Earth? And and this is a, this is a, a great comparison between sort of like how organizations used to be and how maybe how people used to be like it used to be about getting resources and having enough food and making sure you were safe and having shelter most of us in the western world now we got that like that's covered we know how to we know how to make money we know how to you know maintain our basic needs and now personally we're focused on our our, our self-actualization right maslow's pyramid the, yep. The, mm -hmm. yep. hierarchy of needs. Yep. yeah the hierarchy of needs and and so this is that for organizations how do we have organizations that can live their purpose um and I think there was a quote from uh, the CEO of Whole Foods that was saying that if, if all you want to do is make money, if, if all you want to do is have a giant business that makes tons of money, the number one thing you can do is have a purpose-driven business because they go hand in hand these days. It's just it's just emergent. Mm. Um, there was also something interesting I heard recently that in I think Jim Collins um, and credit to credit to Brian for quoting this in one of his podcasts recently. Uh, or, web, or webinars, um, Jim Collins did some work around values, and he basically said it doesn't matter what values your organization has, as long as it has values. Yeah, I've I've heard that as well, which is kind of neat. Well, and I think the interesting thing about values is that you can have them. There's a lot of stuff written on people's walls when you walk in, but how do you live them? Like if you go into the first meeting and or encounter with somebody at that organization, and you're like, really, like integrity. Like or whatever, you know right. what I mean? Like maybe Enron had integrity on their on their wall. I don't know. Uh, like, do they really live those values? Right. I mean, so you really don't see that in, in all organizations, right? Yeah. So so some so some values are, some values are bullshit for one thing, and then on the other side of it, um, 
anytime you have a value, there's something else on the other end of that value. So like, let's take agility, right? We want to be agile. We want to be quick and nimble. What mm -hmm. are we sacrificing? Maybe structure, maybe reliability, maybe consistency. These are all good things in the right context. So anytime you talk about having values, you're also talking about giving something up. And if you can have an organization, so like, I'm not crapping on values here because so few companies have even have thought about this, but, yeah. but what's, what's beyond values? What's after that? What, and what transcends values? And I think that's the idea that if you can have a purpose, the way you, the way you realize the purpose can involve both, let's say, agility and rigidity or structure. And those things can come up as needed depending on the circumstances while still aligning around a specific purpose. So in a sense, holacracy transcends values. Um, it's yeah. interesting, um, two, two thoughts on that. The, the first one was, um, I can't remember where it came from, but it was talking about parenting and like, I, I don't have kids, so I'm not the person to talk on this, but it was essentially, they were trying to figure out like what, what were some of the factors that went into having, or people, adults, parents being good parents in general. And um, it was something to the effect of, it wasn't the fact that when they found good parents, they found a, a correlation to the fact that they had read parenting books, but it wasn't the fact that they read and were doing anything that these books were telling them to, it was that they had actually sought out the information about how to be a better parent. In other words, they gave a damn about being a better parent and thus were better parents because of that, not because of the information that they were able to get from these better parenting books. Wow, interesting. Um, yeah. Now I can't remember what the other thing I was gonna mention, but. Yeah, so I think that that's, that's huge. And I think that's why people are attracted to like most of the organizations doing holacracy tend to attract people that are fairly conscious, you know, so to speak, they're not just in it for the job. And sometimes right. people are actually repelled by the idea of like, oh God, I have to like sense tensions and feel what's going on in my environment. And I have to be more conscious of my roles and I have to change my job description every week or every two weeks in a governance meeting. Um, I have to tell people when I have tension with something that's going on in their roles and I have to learn how to talk to them in a way that is like that communicates my needs but is not offensive like no some people just want to get a paycheck and that's fine um, but for me like this and this is like the, this is like the the, the the cherry on top holacracy has been a personally transformational journey because I have to look at myself and I have to note, I have to notice, okay, is this an issue with me personally, or is this an organizational tension? Is it with one of my roles? Is that person, like, is that person really slacking off, or do they just not even know that they are? They should be accountable. Like, um, the, it really raises the level of consciousness um, for me personally. And then I think the organization itself, you know, you could say it takes on a, a different level of consciousness. Um, because it's constantly evolving and, and it's responding to its environment. Yeah, I, that, you know, Jeff had hit on this a little bit earlier, but basically it's it's inspecting and adapting, right? Like, and you, you can't have that without transparency. And I think this is even with agility, um, when we come in and we're thinking about using Scrum or Kanban or whatever, like one of the trickier elements to any of that stuff, like you, like you were literally just, just talking about is people have to be open to the fact that you will need to change. Right. Change now needs to be uh, a continual conversation and an expectation that what we're doing today is not what we're going to be doing a week, a month, a year from today. Right. So change is just now part of the normal process. Yeah, and I've grown up with that in my DNA. Like, I don't know if DNA is the right word, but <laughs> I, I've grown up with that. And um, I mean, I've moved several times. Um, my parents are divorced. I've just I've had a lot of change in my life, and I'm kind of like, okay, this is this is how it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think when I, I like I I could really learn to resonate better with people who are resistant to change. I hear this like people are resistant to change. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I I've had pretty good luck changing. 
Um, and it's not as scary as you think. Um, but this, but I wanted to talk. I wanted to mention this idea of you mentioned this idea of working agreements at one point, mm -hmm. and really the Constitution is like a big working agreement. And I think that the first thing that an organization can do is start to get explicit about their working agreements. Um, the Holacracy Constitution version five, which is still in development, and if you want to check it out, you can go to GitHub. Like I don't know the exact URL, but if you if you Google GitHub Holacracy Constitution, you should get to the page. Um, the concept of a working agreement now has been added in Colocracy version 5 as a first class citizen and any partner I think can request a working agreement of any other partner, a partner being an employee or a person who's mm -hmm. operating in the organization. And so, um, and what that does is it, it's, it's something that's separate from the organizational structure because holacracy just governs the organization. It doesn't govern the people. It says it has mm -hmm. nothing to say about how people work with work together. Well, it has everything to say about how people work together, but it has nothing to say about how, about the norms around social interaction. Um, and so there's this new concept called working agreements where you can explicitly create an agreement um, with somebody to some end it's very it's very open and then oh and also a person can either choose to agree to the agreement or not and if someone agrees they can remove their agreement at any time um so you may think well now it sounds like this doesn't have any teeth uh yeah i mean it what it what it does is it it gives people the freedom to agree and then to change their mind or to adapt on their own um hmm. and it's just a way of making ex making something explicit that normally is not explicit hmm. like like, hey, can we have a working agreement that we please don't bring, like, don't put fish in the microwave, like, <laughs> you know? And someone might say, well, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I would agree to that. And then, like, okay, fine. Whew. Right. Now, now my level of psychological or olfactory safety has just gone up um, by virtue of that agreement. Um, yeah, you said something that, earlier in the podcast. You talked about, you know, bringing your whole self to work. And I think part of that, right, is, um, you know, being willing to talk about those tensions and bringing that whole part of you to like what what does really bother you or what if it's that fish in the microwave like you should bring that up where a lot of people would just be like oh that person always puts fish in the microwave right um, but we should bring right to talk about that people live their lives with these resentments in and they don't have any way to channel it they don't have any way to process their tensions and i know it sounds like jargon and people say oh holacracy is all full of jargon the words that we choose are are specific and explicit for good reason attention it's like a rubber band stretching it's something you feel and processing attention is resolving that tension right it's, it's, and so once you start thinking in terms of sensing and resolving tensions um that maps into your life overall and i think it's useful in relationships right it's like oh, i'm noticing i'm having this feeling about my partner how am i going to process this how am i going to resolve this tension um and there's also this really cool concept of tensioning the system, which is uh, you process your tension and you let the system process its tensions. You let others process their tension. So um, let's take the microwave example. I process my tension. I get an agreement that people aren't going to put uh, fish in the microwave. Cool. Just so happens my coworker is a pescatarian. Now they have a tension to process. So it's okay to make a mess. It's okay to like something that prevents change in organizations is when you, you try to solve for everything at once and what you end up, you end up solving for nothing. So basically what, what we're saying is, okay, let's, and this is, this probably overlaps with a lot of agile principles. Let's take the smallest possible change we can make. Let's solve a specific tension and then let's let, let other tensions emerge knowing that we can process them and trusting our partners that they can process their own tensions. Yeah, it's definitely into... an empirical system, that's for sure. That's what you're describing right there, where you're, it's, you're, you're doing things in small increments, you're inspecting and adapting, and you're making that things transparent, right? Like, that's the core yeah. of, of really any Agile framework, is using empiricism. Yeah, that's awesome. Nice. Have nice. you have you ever seen um, organizations that are using Holacracy, but then maybe also using Scrum or Kanban or Extreme Programming or some other Agile framework? Yeah, so that, that's a really common question. It's like, how do we? So how do we do Agile with uh, with Holacracy? Um, 
And I mean, at Holacracy One, we were doing that. We, we started out doing something that was fairly scrum-like. We would have sprint planning meetings and we would um, accumulate, you know, kind of what we kind of, we kind of eyeballed it and thought, okay, that's about what, what we can get done in two weeks. Um, and then we worked towards it. Um, and basically, uh, I mean, Holacracy is really designed as a meta framework. You, so you can model anything, any other system or process you want with it. We, so we had sprint planning meetings. Um, we had stand-ups. Um, we had retros. And these are all independent from the tactical meeting and governance meeting, which are the required meeting formats in Holacracy, tactical and governance. Um, one thing we did is we would add in a little bit of like a like a bug review or like a like let's let's go over the backlog in the tactical meeting, and one way that showed up is that um, the the role that had the like the, the scrum master role, he would just bring an item to the triage section in 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 the tactical meeting. Anybody can bring an item up in the triage part of the meeting, and so every every meeting every week he would say okay uh, bug review. And then the facilitator would say, bug review, what do you need? And he would say, I'd like to go over the sprint backlog. Okay. And then he had the floor until it was done. Um, but you don't have to do it that way. You can also have other meetings. You can also call a meeting that's just strict, you know, strict scrum. Um, one thing that was really interesting, see, that, but, but any, any organization outside of development, any part of the organization, organization outside of the development, they don't know how to do sprint like sprints and backlogs and all this stuff. What they got was if they just do tactical meetings, and I could probably spend the rest of my life just teaching people to do tactical meetings, and I would be very fulfilled because it's mm. such a rich process. If they just do tactical meetings, they get like ninety percent of like the agility, um, and you never have to say the word backlog or you know I don't know. Um, I, I digress. So is that what, do you start with that with a lot of organizations? Like, hey, this constitution, like changing everything, that's a big change all at once. Maybe they're not ready for that. Hey, let's just work on this tactical meeting. Let's just try introducing this in your current structure, see how this works, define some roles, like add some clarity and see if you want to take the next steps. Is that maybe something you, you try doing with some organizations? So I know um, I know that uh, Brian Robertson, the creator of Holacracy, I think his his stance previously, and this may have changed, is that if you're going to do Holacracy, just go all in, all at once, start playing tomorrow, um, start doing governance, start doing uh, tacticals, and start processing your tensions and learn on the fly. That's really, really um, challenging for a lot of organizations. Right. And and I think there's so much low-hanging fruit that, yeah, I think, like, let's just start by, let's just start with roles. Let's just all write down our roles and accountabilities. Cool. And then yeah, let's let's get a facilitator and let's have a facilitator facilitate all of our meetings and let's do them in tactical format or at least do tactical meetings. Um, and so I think that roles and account yeah like role structure uh, is a great first step and just have your boss write those up like that's how you do it now. Um, so imagine a single role that's accountable for writing down all of the organizational structure in the circle, just in the circle, not in the whole organization, just in just on your team. Um, and then people who fill those roles can pitch that can pitch the circle lead to say, "Hey, um, can you uh, can you update my role? It's not accurate." Or, "Hey, I need another role. Can you create another role?" Um, and now you're starting to step into the world of holacracy, and you're starting to trying to bring up all the questions that are going to emerge around, like, "Well, how do you create a role? How do you fill a role? Well, what if we don't have the resources to fill that role?" And there are answers for that in the framework. Um, and what I, what I hope is that, yeah, if people start with roles and tactical format, that they will be led down the path. They'll be, they'll be on the journey to doing full distributed authority with Holacracy. Sure. So you kind of just hit on it, but one of the interesting things that um, I had taken away, I think it was both from your talk and, and the book was similar to Kanban is during that rollout, you, you start with reality, start with what it is today. Like if you're, if this is your role, this is your structure, this is what we need to start with, not what we want it to be. Otherwise we're kind of gumming up our, our, our change process when right from the get go. Is that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, to me, to me, it seems obvious, but um, yeah, start with how things are. Don't try to change it. Just describe what's real. And what's great about that is that it's easy. 
because you're not <laughs> you don't have to make anything up you don't have to use your imagination you just describe the world and as soon as you have that then you can start to start to change it in response to the environment so um let's let's take a few steps back here because we went in a very good uh direction but so you you had started out as a developer had a really cool um, interview onboarding process with with holacracy one um i'm assuming your role there um or i think i'm using that word actually correctly um but transition from whatever they called a developer somebody who's slinging code to something else is is that appropriate yeah so in holacracy you have many roles um and we call it the, we call it the role constellation so um you might have roles in different circles, different teams. Uh, I started primarily in the developer role. That's what I was hired for. That was my, my main role fit. That's why I got the big bucks because developers are you know, a, a very sp special scarce resource. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't limited. And this is what I love about it. I wasn't typecast as a developer for the rest of my life. And you know, my existence was not pulling stories off a backlog and writing commit messages. Um, so I started in the developer role. I did some cool work um, around that. And then I also realized that we didn't have a mobile app. We needed a mobile app, or so I thought. So I pitched my circle lead and I said, hey, would it make sense for us to have a mobile app? And he said, well, yes, it would. This is the condensed version, obviously. Um, I said, okay, cool. Would it make sense to you to create a role for mobile? And he did. And then I said, would it make sense for you to fill me into that role? And he said, yes, and he did. And then I was in the role of, of mobile. Okay, but now I don't have any resources. How am I gonna make this happen? So then um, we, have a, we have a spending authorization process at Holacracy One where when you spend money, you can spend money if you announce it and you give any role a chance to object and you do it from a role. So I can't just like say like, hey, I need to buy something you know like you can't just do anything crazy you have to actually say what role you're coming from and this is a really common thing that you'll see is people announcing the role that they're coming from and the role they're speaking to especially mm -hmm. in tactical meetings you might hear the word i intend like i intend to spend two thousand dollars to um buy 20 hours of uh time on aws so i can do machine learning in my role as developer mm. Now, if the janitor role said that, you might say, well, gosh, that doesn't sound like what that role cares about. Is there a different role that you're energizing that, can, that wants to do that? Um, so before I even spent a dollar, I had to get into the mobile role. And then I got the authorization to, uh, to hire some external help that was specialized in mobile. And here, I'm not actually sitting there writing all the code. Now, I, I did contribute to the code, but I was able to get resources in my role as, role as mobile that could help with um, with doing this, and it was an outsourced firm. And I think at the time, Holacracy One didn't really work with outsourced firms much, but through me doing that, that became a, something that happened more commonly. Um, and so now there's there's an outsourced firm that like works with the developer team on the core product. Um, we had uh, we did a UX revamp using an outsourced team. Um, so getting back to kind of my journey, um, yeah, I started as developer and, um, I moved into, I did, I worked on mobile for a while. I picked up a cup of the facilitator of the circle. I love facilitation. I love working with people, obviously. Um, and so I, I, I got into the facilitator role. Um, I pitched myself to assist at a couple of trainings. So I was just in the back of the room helping out, um, in a specific role for a limited time there got more experience um, you know, around the training circle. Um, I went to the Holacracy Forum in my developer role to, to talk about GlassFrog, the software. Um, and basically, yeah, like I just you know, processed my own tensions, my personal tensions, not on behalf of the organization, but the organization helped me satisfy my own needs. And that's a really delicate line is what does the organization need and what do I need? But I was able to use the, the, the levers of role assignment to have a more fulfilled life. Um, 
and ultimately towards the end like i was not i was not contributing that much in my developer role and that's part of the reason i left like there are other guys that are better than me at that and that's great um, and i wouldn't be sitting here talking to you probably if i was still pulling tickets off a of backlog and writing commit messages so is that sort of like your it's such a bad word that it, well it's not but i think people treated it your idp plan your your individual development plan like that's how you thought about it as here's these tensions that i want to change it's this is where i want to go or this is this is what needs to change with how i am in life at my job et yeah yeah I, th I think that that resonates for me um i've never heard the term idp before um, oh, okay it's a manager term okay <laughs> Um, it's probably a very useful construct for lots of people. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know I mean, what? God bless you that you never heard that, man. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to work with uh, an organization that was doing things differently, and um, I wanted to be—I wanted to do more than write code. And I knew I could contribute a great deal by doing that. Um, and so, yeah, it's just organic. It, it evolved. My role constellation evolved over time. So I think that's a good segue because we're kind of getting wrapped up here. What, you know, what is the future for you? And, you know, you're now in the, the Madison market. What, what is your, what tensions are you currently working on and what's your goals at this point? Yeah. So one of my big tensions is how to explain what I do to people and to find people that are, are interested in this. Um, I really want to do more um, coaching and training um, and teaching people pieces of, any any piece of this puzzle that will that will help advance them and their teams. Uh, being at CultureCon was great because I was with I was around a lot of people who are interested in change management and doing change management initiatives. Um, so I'm really interested in doing any uh, in doing um, transformation projects, uh, general training around these principles. Um, and I'm also using my developer skills um, to develop a software product called Teal Dog. Uh, teal.dog. It's still pretty. It's still very, uh, very beta. I think you might be able to sign up for it by the time you hear this. Um, but basically, uh, there are a number of tools out there that do holacracy style management. And the purpose of Teal Dog is to is to just give you the basics, just the role structure, and allow you to really just use the pieces that you want instead of having to go all in. Um, and it's a much less opinionated way to do some of this self-management stuff than Glassfrog, which is the Holacracy One product, which does the best job of, it's, it, Glassfrog is the best tool for doing Holacracy, hands down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm developing something that I think is a little bit easier to use. So, um, so yeah, the, fu the future for me, I'm hanging out and I've got my own backlog that I write and I'm writing my own features, and I hope those are gonna make people's lives better. And then uh, also, yeah, just sharing as much of this as I can, and that, that looks like meetups, that looks like going into companies. Um, and I don't know where it's gonna go, and I'm gonna steer dynamically on the fly. Awesome. Was That's Jeff, awesome. was there something you wanted to jump hey, in? I got with? a quick question about you, your name, Teal Dog. So is that from uh, Patrick, um, Patrick? And Lowe's uh, reinventing organizations, yeah, the Fred, Teal organization. Yeah, Fre Frederick. Yeah, that where you get uh, the yeah, that's where, that's where the name Teal comes from. Um, it's hard to find a short domain name, and uh, the it really grew on me. Actually, I was kind of like, oh, I don't know, what am I going to do with this domain name? But now that it's out there, you can think of it as a it's a Teal dog that helps you on your holacracy journey, or your your self management journey. Holacracy is a is a trademark of Holacracy One, and we need to be careful about how we use that word. Awesome. So any anything else that you would like to plug, um, you know, Twitter, your email, what anything else you want to put out there? And I'll be sure to include those in the show notes as well. Um, just that I love talking about this stuff and I'm, I'm happy to um, I'm happy to chat with anyone who's interested in bringing it to the organization. If, if you want to if you want to get on a call, do a free hour or two like that's cool. Um, it's not so much about the money. It's about making the world a better place. Uh, and I do hope that the money will follow because I'm not building a whole lot of hours right now um other than that yeah teal dog's awesome um the the holacracy one trainings are amazing if anyone's really serious about this go to the practitioner training it is so good it's experiential you get a ton out of it um i love the guys at holacracy one i know i'm not there anymore um but i, I have so much respect and love for those guys um 
and let's see my email j at teal dot dog and uh, I'll give you my phone number you can publish that too I'm, I'm just happy to happy to get out there and talk cool anything you want to wrap up with Jeff no I don't think I have awesome. anything that I need to plug right now well I guess I'll make this announcement. I, I recently just went out on my own uh, completely, uh, left my W-2 job, and uh, am now out um, as an independent agile coach, um, organizational agility advisor, um, have my own company, Humane Consulting. And uh, I don't know, just really exciting to get started doing that. Um, so that's the big big news for me and uh, lots of change going on in, in my, own, my own life with that. Awesome. All right, I think we'll wrap it up there.